Hello everybody, welcome back to ECMATH. Today we're going to talk about polar equations and how to convert the equations from rectangular to polar. So just to be clear, we're not really talking today about polar graphing. This is the algebra video. Um, but I am going to talk for just a second about polar graphing because I think it motivates what we're doing here. And honestly, I think the book does this backwards. Um, if I was doing things I would first teach you about the polar system and polar points, see my last video, then we would learn how to create all these cool nifty polar equations, there's some pretty cool polar equations out there, we would learn about graphing them, and then finally we would learn about all the algebra. Your book, I don't know why, but Bob has decided that he's going to put the algebra first, uh, and so we are going to also learn the algebra first. Um, so here's your basic crash course in polar equations. Uh, Rectangular equations often have y as a function of x, right? x is the independent variable, y is the dependent variable, x is the input, y is the output. Polar equations often have r as a function, it's not written quite this way, as a function of theta. So you can imagine the theta is kind of swinging around and at every different angle there's a specific radius plotted. Now that can give you some pretty nifty stuff. Um, for example, this is a polar function. Now, I have plotted this here on a rectangular grid because on a rectangular grid, this is very much not a function, right? It fails the vertical line test in pretty much every single way. Uh, it fails it super badly right here. Three places failing the vertical line test. But guess what? On the polar system, same graph, just on a polar grid instead, Every radius, every angle theta has some unique radius. It might be zero, and it might be that every some angle thetas, like this angle, has a negative radius. But between positive and negative radiuses, you're actually able to have every angle have a specific radius, and you can create some graphs that are not functions in the rectangular system, but are functions in the polar system. So it's very, very powerful, and often you'll find yourself just completely in the polar coordinate system. Um, graphing things like this, this is called a rose curve. Um, there's also graphs like uh, this that are called uh, limassons. Uh, it stands for snail, or short for snail in French. We'll, we'll talk about that next class, actually. But I want to introduce to you a example of a calculus problem. So say that you have something like this in the polar coordinate system, but then uh, actually... Maybe we'll go over here. So you have something like this that's graphed in the polar coordinate system, but there's also on the same grid a rectangular line. Maybe the line, I don't know, y equals x minus 2. And if you draw that line out, okay, there's our line. It kind of creates, you could imagine, a number of regions. Maybe here's a region. You know, I'm going to shade it in. That makes this nifty shape, kind of like part of an oval, just like a weird section of a flower. And you might be curious, what's the area of that region? This is often a problem you'll ask in calculus. Well, to find the area of that region, you got to be able to find those intersection points. And right now we've got a problem, because this in red here is a polar equation. But this in purple, y equals uh, x minus 2, is a rectangular equation. And you can't find the intersection, guys, of a polar equation with a rectangular equation. It's just impossible. So what we're going to have to do to solve this calculus problem in calculus next year is take one of these two equations and convert it to the other coordinate system. And in this case, the thing that we will do uh, would do is convert y equals x minus 2 into the polar coordinate system r and theta so that we could find the r and theta of the intersection points. That is our goal. We're going to now leave the graphs behind a little bit. Um, well, here, here's another example of, of such a calculus problem. You might have this limason, uh, and you might be trying to find the area of this pretty complicated shape where it's enclosed by two lines and also doesn't include this middle loop. So you'd have to find, you know, this is a pretty nifty shape. 
We really might be very interested to find the area of that nifty shape. But if you can't find those four intersection points, because your lines and your uh, curve are in different coordinates, you're going to be having a very bad time. All right, so we're going to leave the graphs behind now um, and talk about uh, how you might find it. Actually, we're not. I have one more example for you, too. Um, here's another calculus problem that might say, oh, guys, find the intersection point of r equals 2 cosine theta and r equals cosecant theta. And notice these are both in the polar coordinate system. So you're like, oh, now i got to do all this polar math. Oh, I hate trig. Trig is the worst. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Guess what? If you convert these to rectangular, and look at the graph, and I did it on Desmos, but you could, that's pretty trivial to do by hand. If you convert them to rectangular and look at the graph, what you're really looking at is a circle and a line. And the circle and line, clearly from this graph, intersect at the point 1, 1. That's another example of why you might use this, is if you have something in polar, it might actually be easier to switch it to rectangular so that you can analyze it better. So we're either doing this so that we can make our, our two curves be in matching systems, or just so that we can have uh, maybe analyze something in polar a little more easily. Okay, now we're really going to get into the algebra, I promise. So I want to remind you again about the polar coordinate and equation conversion factors, and I'm just going to say again, you should memorize these for calculus if you plan on doing any polar coordinate conversion. It's really good to have these. Where do they come from? They come from this picture right here, where this point has coordinates r comma theta, which we label as r, and theta, but you can also imagine it has the coordinates y and x. I guess I'll do that in blue. And that leads us to four statements. Uh, first, y is equivalent to r cosine, nope, sine theta. I usually do x first. x is equivalent to r cosine theta. x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared, and these are the big three, but it's also true that uh, y over x is equal to the tangent of theta. And we'll use that a little bit, but we're going to mostly use, we'll say, these big three right here. Uh, so just, I would, what I would do maybe is as you watch this video, have these written down somewhere else. Um, I'll write them down where I need to, but if you, you feel like you want to have those in front of you, this would be a good time to make a little note card for each of them. Um, or put them all on the same note card. I don't really care. All right, so uh, the first group of problems is going to say convert from rectangular into polar and express r in terms of theta. The second part's actually really important, right? We're saying that a polar equation is a function. r is f of theta. So in my final answer, I need to have a single r on one side and only thetas on the other. And if I haven't done that, I'm not actually done with the problem. So you do have to kind of be really persistent here, and just plugging some junk in is not always going to be enough. Um, in fact, this r in terms of theta sometimes is the, the most challenging part of the problem. Um, I also want to use this section to get used to what different polar equations look like. So for example, uh, problem number one, x plus 5y equals 8. We know what this is. It's a line. Um, if y is 0, x is 8. If x is 0, y is like that, so it's a line with a negative slope kind of going down uh, through the first quadrant, right? That's what this graph looked like, and it's going to look the same. It's going to be the same graph in polar, just with a different formula. Um, and why might we do this again? Well, maybe we have this line, and we want to find the intersection of it with, you know, some crazy polar curve, so we need both of them to be in polar coordinates. Uh, might be what we're doing here. Okay, how are we going to do it? Well, I have an x and a y, so I know that x is r cosine theta, and I know that y whoa, is r sine theta. So I'm going to start to write a 5 r sine theta, and say that's equal to 8. Okay, now you're like, I'm done! It's in polar! Hooray! I'm done! No, you're not, because I have not expressed r in terms of theta. In fact, I have two r's. I need to isolate them on a single side and make it so there's only one r, and the best way to do that is factoring. So we're going to factor that r out. And then we don't have to get fancy. We're down to a single r right now. Yay! 
So all you're going to do is divide by this term. And the final polar equation will look like this. R equals 8 over cosine theta plus 5 sine theta. Uh, and so that would be how you, you create your final answer. Notice how kind of frustrating this is, right? Like, what a simple, beautiful rectangular equation. X plus 5, Y is 8. Any, any fool could graph that. Um, and you convert it into polar, it gets a whole lot messier. That often happens, that you'll have something that's either nice in one system, but really bad in the other. Very rare is it for something to be nice in both systems. Um, so the reason to convert that to polar really is just so that you can be like finding some intersections uh, with another polar curve, because it's not true that all polar curves can be converted to rectangular nicely. All right, next one, y equals 3. Oh, you might be looking at this and saying, hey, I know what that is. That's a, that's a line. It is. So what is this? It's a horizontal line through the point 3, so we have the equation y equals 3. It's like, well, how bad can that be? Hmm. All right. Well, I know that y is r sine theta. So I have the equation r sine theta equals 3. I need to solve it for r. So I'm going to divide by sine theta and get r is equal to 3 over sine theta. I'd be okay if you left that here, but you could also consider this to be r is equal to 3 times cosecant theta. And that's where those reciprocal trig functions come in. That's why we have to teach this after we've taught all the trig identities. Oh my gosh, a use for trig identities. Who knew? Um, and so that's a way to convert this rectangular equation into a polar format. And again, very useful if you're trying to find the intersection of two polar curves now. All right, let's do one more conversion. This is my kind of favorite kind, um, because it's something that's kind of messy and rectangular. And actually, in rectangular, this is not a function at all, right? Like, yeah, we know what it is. It's a circle, um, because we've, we've done all the, the units before that teach us how to graph circles. But if you ever try to graph one of these on your calculator and solve it for y to graph like a function, you have, you have to do all kinds of weird plus or minus-y nonsense. And in polar, it's actually is a function. It's actually better in polar. But uh, let's think about what kind of circle this is. So I have uh, x squared plus y plus 3 squared equals r squared. So I'm going to have uh, down at negative 3 the center and this is r squared so the radius is going to be 3. So it looks like it's going to be some kind of circle centered at 0 comma negative 3 because it's x minus 0. Um, with a radius 3. So that's what we're looking at. Now, how are we going to convert this? Okay, so if I'm thinking about circles, I probably should be thinking about the conversion factor x squared plus y squared equals r squared. And I kind of have that x squared, I see the x squared, uh, but I want to see if I can get a y squared. So what you first have to do, or what I would first do, is multiply out this binomial. So that's going to be y squared plus uh, 6y plus 9 equals 9. And now you're actually allowed to solve this around, so to make it something like x squared plus y squared plus 6y equals 0, right? Subtract 9 from both sides. That's nice, because then that constant term has gone away. All right, let's start to substitute. So I know that x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. And I know that y is equal to r sine theta. So what I really have is r squared plus r sine theta equals 0. Hmm. Okay, now I have a, this thing where I have two r's, and I need them to kind of go away. Well, guess what? I can just divide everything by r. 0 over r is 0. r over r is 1. And r squared over r is r. So really, this simplifies to r plus sine of theta Oh, I forgot a 6 somewhere. 6 sine theta. 6 sine theta equals 0. And that means that r, all I have to do is make r equal to negative 6 sine theta. And that's your final answer. And this is part of why I think polar equations are so kind of beautiful.
What would you rather have to type in to your calculator or rather have to do algebra with if you're finding the intersections of curves and points? Would you rather find the intersection of that thing on the top that's not even a function? Or would you rather find the intersection of negative 6 sine theta? That's like about as easy a trig equation as you could possibly get. So when you're graphing things that are circles, it actually makes a whole lot of sense, even if they're not centered at the origin, it makes a whole lot of sense to convert back to polar, because where does polar come from? Well, circles. It's the natural graphing format for anything that is circle-y. Uh, and that's why that came out so nice. Speaking of circles, let's look at our next group of examples, which is converting from polar into rectangular. So when we're in polar, we're going to be given something where it's r is a function of theta, and we have to convert it into something where y is a function of x. Or if we can't convert it to a function of x, for this one, it's okay uh, to not be a function. But it does have to be in some kind of standard form. It has to be in the standard form for the object that it's creating. So it kind of, you know, that's going to depend. Are you making a line? Are you making a circle? Um, but you should put it in one of the, the normal forms for that shape. Okay. Now, r equals 10. You actually, if you think hard enough about this, don't need to do any polar equations. Here's what I mean by that. If r equals 10, that means that for all theta, the radius is 10, which means that no matter what angle you're at, you're going to be 10 units away from the origin. So what are we looking at? Oh my gosh, we're looking at a circle. It's probably the most basic of polar graph. And again, look how easy this is. This is basically the like x equals 2 of polar graphs, right? It's really easy to make a circle centered at the origin for polar. So you could probably look at that and say it's a circle with radius 10. I know the equations of circles. They're x squared plus y squared equals uh, 100. Um, so... You could just guess x squared plus y squared equals 100. But say you wanted to use the algebra to prove it, here's how you would do that. If r equals 10 and you want to convert it, well, I don't actually have a conversion for r, but I do know that r squared is x squared plus y squared. So what I can do, and it's totally legal to do this, is square both sides. Ah. So then you get r squared is 100. r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. So I can substitute in x squared plus y squared equals 100. And now I'm done because I've created the equation of a circle. It's not a function. I don't have to solve this for y. That would actually be a waste of effort. Uh, but it's created an equation that you can now recognize is a circle. And it's the same equation of the circle that we thought it would be from making the graph. Um, so that's one way to do it. Uh, you're definitely allowed to square both sides. Do you always square both sides? No. There's some other tricks you want to use as well. But uh, that's one of them. All right. Next example of a polar equation. Uh, theta is equal to pi over 3. Again here, it's actually nice to think this out. This is saying for uh, all r you have the same theta, or I guess technically it's saying that uh, for, for pi over 3, there's no radius here. It's not like r equals blah. You just have all r's. So what are we doing? We're going to the angle pi over 3, and then we're plotting a point at every possible radius that has the angle pi over 3, both positive and don't forget that radii can be negative. So what have we made? We've made a line. That's pretty cool. And if once you understand that that's a line, you could probably do a pretty good job at finding the equation of this line. You know the inter intercept is 0, 0. So all you really have to find is the slope. But again, let's uh, use our 
conversion factors and see what we can do with this. For a line, you want to use the conversion factor. Tangent theta equals y over x. This is probably the, the main time you use this conversion factor. So tangent of pi over 3 is equal to y over x. Tangent of pi over 3 is just a number that you can evaluate. Um, from that 30, 60, 90 triangle, tangent of pi over 3 is just going to be root 3 over 1, or root 3 is equal to y over x. Now, this is not a standard form for the equation of a line, but if I multiply both sides by x, I can get x root 3 equals y, or if I want to really make it look nice, y equals root 3x, and I have something of the form, you know, y equals mx plus b now, so that is the equation of the line, y equals root 3x, just using the tangent factor to find the slope of that angle. Basically, the tangent, since tangent is y over x, tangent of theta tells you the slope. And there you go. So that's how you convert uh, a line like that. Those first two examples were kind of trivial because you could just use your, you could draw the graph using logic and then forget that it's impolar and just tell the equation of the graph based on the graph you drew. So conversion factors weren't really necessary. But here they are going to be, because I got no clue what the graph of 6 secant theta is. So let's use some uh, good algebra. I don't have any conversion factors for secant, but I do know that it's 1 over cosine. So that's what I'm going to write. R is 6 over cosine of theta. And again, hey, it's those trig identities. Aren't we glad we learned those? Let's multiply both sides by cosine theta. Not R. So we get, uh, I'm going to put the r in front, r cosine theta equals, well those cancel out, 6. Wait a minute, r cosine theta, I know what that is, we have a conversion factor for that. That's equal to x, because we have the conversion factor, x equals r cosine theta. So what is this equation really? It's just the equation, x equals 6. That is, this is another one of those, one, two, three, four, five, six, straight lines. It just happens to be that this one's a vertical line. Hey, and guess what? This is actually another really interesting thing. In rectangular, this is not a function. Why? Because it fails the vertical line test. It is a vertical line, so it fails its own test. But guess what? In polar, this is a function. So, um, you know, it, it actually is drawn, basically every angle plots a slightly further out point, and as the angle gets bigger, the radius gets bigger, and that's how secant works, until you get to a vertical line, then it jumps to the other side. So it actually kind of draws, if you draw this on a polar grapher, it draws it up, and then takes a little break, and then actually draws it back in from negative infinity. It's very interesting uh, to see. I might post some links in our description to some interesting polar graphers uh, for these vertical lines. So it's really neat to see how they convert to polar and how a polar equation, right, secant and cosine should be about circles. How do they make lines? Well, because they do. Uh, because secant has some values where it's undefined, and as it approaches infinity, it kind of approaches a line shape, and, and that's where they go. All right, let's do one last one. I think this is our last one of the day. And I'm going to put a big uh, star by this one. This is probably the most common type of equation that you have to convert. And there is a trick. And without my trick, or this trick, you're going to be in trouble. And you're going to have no clue what to do. Now this example is the only one I'm going to do, so I would advise you to pay some very close attention. This is your prize for watching to the end of this video. All right. Now, I have a single r. I can't do anything with a single r. So I need to get an r squared. Okay? One thing I could do is square both sides. But here's the problem. This is illegal. Here's what's completely illegal. Don't even write this down. You can't just do this. Oh, 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 everything's squared now. Doesn't work. You're squaring both sides. You have to like square both sides, like a binomial. You'd get 64 cosine squared theta, then you'd have 16 times 2, 32 sine theta cosine theta plus 
4 sine squared theta. And this is all kinds of trouble. We have no idea what to do with this. These almost equal 1, right? Except that the coefficients don't match, so you can't even make those match up. This is just bad. Do not square both sides. Do not square both sides. But here is what you can do. Multiply both sides by r. And this is the thing that, that it's hard for folks to come up with because you have to kind of come in from just the middle of nowhere with a, with a mysterious r to multiply by that you don't see in the problem. But this is the trick. So look at what happens. I'm going to multiply on the, the right and left. Now, the left side becomes r squared like I wanted. And on the right side, since this is a plus sign, you have to distribute to both terms. And we get r squared is equal to 8r cosine theta plus 2r sine theta. Okay? I'm putting the r right in the middle of those terms because the r cosine theta and r sine theta are kind of our goal. And if you think about this, this is a multiplication, so it's commutative within each term. You can switch the order of those r's around and put them wherever you want them. You can't put them inside the theta, but you can put them anywhere else. Now I want to do all of my substitutions. r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. 8 is 8, but r cosine theta is equal to x plus, well, 2 is 2, but r sine theta is equal to y. And this is our formula. This is now in rectangular form. So this is in rectangular, but it's not standard. That is, I'm not sure what type of equation I'm even looking at. Am I looking at a circle? Am I looking at a line? What's going on here? So you have to, you're actually done here as soon as you multiply by r. But if you want to put it in standard form, which you should, you have to do the following. x squared minus 8x plus y squared minus 2y equals 0. Right? We're going to put everything on one side. And oh, what are we going to do now? We're going to complete the square. Complete the square. How do we do this? Well, remember that I'm going to add something here. What am, I, what am I going to add? I'm going to add b divided by 2 quantity squared. So uh, 8 over 2 quantity squared is 16. And I can't just add 16 to one side. I have to add 16 to both sides. So I'm going to add 16 there. And here I need to add the same thing. It's going to be b over 2 quantity squared. 2 over 2 is 1. Quantity squared is 1. So I'm going to add 1 to both sides. And this side will equal 17. Ah, that's fun. I would never have guessed that. But this side will then equal x minus 4 quantity squared. That's that b over 2. This is how it factors perfectly. Plus y minus 1 quantity squared. So I'm just taking each of these and factoring it. It is worthwhile to take yourself just a brief second and remind yourself how to complete the square. Go back to your notes from chapter P, math 3, wherever you learn to do this. These aren't particularly tricky completing the square problems. Like, I know you've done much harder problems in math 3 about completing the square. Um, but there is a little bit of this completing the square action going on. So, oh, should not cover up the square bits. This is going to be telling you everything you need to know about your circle. Specifically, it's going to have center 4, 1, and radius equal to square root 17. So that's how you're going to solve a problem like this. You multiply both sides by r, plug in x squared, y squared, x, and y. It's entirely rectangular, but then you have to complete the square. All right, folks. So we've done a lot today. We've converted rectangular to polar. We've converted polar to rectangular. We talked a little bit about why you might do this. The thing that you got to do now is just practice, practice, practice.
You, these, uh, the only way to learn this is to actually do it, pencil to paper. Watching is not the same as, as doing. Uh, so that's what I'm going to send you off to do now. Do your homework problems. Let me know what questions you have uh, in the comments below or shoot me an email. Uh, good luck, and I will see you all next time.